Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you for tuning in to McDougal's Medicine with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I'm their daughter and your host, Heather McDougal. And tonight, just like every night, we're going to get to questions. But first, I know we want to hear from you, Dad, Dr. McDougal. Great to see you both. How are you? Well, we're excited. We're good. Yeah, we're doing just fine. Good. <clears throat> Let's see. I, I know, Heather, you get a lot of complaints about, you know, the fact that I'm old and I, I realized that I started working like 47, 48 years before you, most of you did, at least in the, in the area of nutrition. And so, you know, uh, most of the literature that I quote is old stuff because that's when I wrote the books. And what I'd like to do is, well, you know, I, I, the other thing is, is I don't know that there's that much new for me to learn. You know, I, I'd like to hope there is, but that so little has changed in medicine since I've been in it for over half a half a, uh, a century, you know, more than 50 years. I, I'm just amazed. The same chemotherapy drugs, same surgeries, same basically everything. And even the truth was known back then. And I know a lot of you don't realize it, but I'm here to tell you the truth don't change, folks. <laughs> so we're going to, to get into that in just a minute here. Uh all right, let's start out with this. I have been uh, working with some fellow doctors and trying to convince them that they should not do aggressive treatment when it comes to breast cancer. And I wrote a whole chapter in a book. In fact, I wrote several chapters in books about how to care for a person who has breast cancer. And one of the things that I've objected to and still object to is taking the lymph nodes out of a woman's arm on the, on the affected side. What happens when you take these lymph nodes out is there's no drainage from the hand and the forearm. And so the arm swells terribly and they're in pain. Uh, it, it's a deformity you can see, it's called lymphedema. And besides that, those lymph nodes are there to protect you. They're there to deal with the cancer. When you remove them, you have an increased risk of dying and metastases. So, you know, when I wrote this book, what is it, uh, uh, almost 40 years ago, it was published 40 years ago. I wrote it before that. So it's it's a 40-year-old discussion. There's a chapter in this book. Are you still giving this book away free, Heather? Well, no, anyway. we stopped in March. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, but at times, we, we give this book away free. And, and right now, it's $10. But you can see what I wrote about lymph nodes back then. You can take the time to read it. Okay? And look, this is 10 years later almost. And the same stuff is still the same thing you talk about. Well, here's, here's, the, it's not 10 years later. It's April 4th, uh, 20, 2024. This standard advice to doctors today is to not take those lymph nodes out. That you do the patient no good, you do a terrible harm. Published in the New England Journal of Medicine, April 4th, 2024. Why do they do it then? Well, doctors are very conservative people. They, they change slowly. And plus, you get more money to pay, take out the lymph nodes. Oh, but that's terrible. I mean, you know. You know, a, a simple surgery like a lumpectomy is inexpensive compared to a mastectomy. Add radiation, that's a few more thousand dollars. Add chemotherapy. Oh. Money's always the motivator, Mary. That's terrible. It is terrible. That, terrible. This, this is something I've been fighting against almost as much as I've been fighting against giving post-operative radiation after you do a lumpectomy. You should not do that. All you should do is just take the lump out clear margins, change your diet, maybe take some anti-estrogen treatment. You know, I came up with this well over, you know, close to 50 years ago. And I haven't had to change my mind because the truth be known back then. And it hasn't changed. All right, same thing, same discussions. You could go through my previous writings, my previous books. I, I'd, I'd send you back to the newsletters. There's a section called Hot Topics. And uh, under the medical therapy, there's a whole section on treating prostate cancer. You read that. You know, I, I, I wrote it before the mid-2005. Uh, yeah, mid I wrote it before that. Well, uh, what, what they say is prostate screening antigen, you know, PSA. Read the title. PSA, 15-year cancer mortality. No change. There's no survival benefit. I'm and, sorry, and I'm Dad. I don't. What? I don't mean to interrupt, but do you mean to be sharing your screen? Yeah, I do. <laughs> You're not. I'm not huh? <laughs> You're pointing right, at stuff. I'm like, wait, we're supposed to be seeing something. 
You know, you know why, Heather? I forgot to push the share screen button. All Sorry, right, let's everyone. Start over. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you know, that's oh, going so well, too. Yeah, I, I had a good discussion here. Okay, here we go. Here, here, here is here is here is the 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 chapter I wrote in this book or the section I wrote on lymph nodes. All right, do you see it now, Heather? Yes, okay. we do. Thanks. Here, here is the book, the challenging second opinion, which we were offering for free last month. And every once in a while, Heather puts one of our books up for free. And then here you see an article out of the New England Journal of Medicine, April fourth, twenty twenty four. It's like what three days ago. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it could become more current, omitting axillary dissection and breast cancer with sentinel node metastases. In other words, is there any is there any good done? The answer is no. You know, even taking just one node out as opposed to the whole axilla, they're, they're talking about not even doing that, not even sampling the nodes. So just to repeat, lumpectomy, clear margins, no extra radiation afterwards postoperatively after you do the lumpectomy, no chemotherapy, no radical surgery, and I recommend some anti-estrogen treatments. Thank you, Heather. Now let's get on to the PSA study. All right, here you go. Prostatic specific antigens. Let's see, this was published uh, April 6th, yesterday. <laughs> oh my goodness, how much more current could you get? Anyway, uh, it's from the Journal of the American Medical Association. It's a a 15 year study using PSA test to determine whether or not you live longer if you're in the screen group compared to the control group that doesn't get the PSA test. PSA test, prosthetic specific antigens, what's called. It's a blood protein, it's a sugar protein that's produced by uh, the prostate gland. If you rub the prostate gland by doing a digital rectal examination, you raise the PSA. You get a little infection, you raise the PSA. I mean, there are many reasons you raise the PSA. But of course, one of them is if you have uh, prostate cancer. But the PSA doesn't start going up until the prostate cancer has been growing for 10 years on average. It's the size of an eraser of a pencil. It's one centimeter in size before it's large enough to raise the PSA level in a man's blood. And then, and then if somebody comes looking for you, you got a 10% chance of them finding you with a positive PSA test. You're just going out on the street, you know, asking for your blood. 10% of the time, you're going to end up with a positive PSA test, which is going to require a biopsy. I know you're going to want to get a biopsy. And you have a 30% chance of being diagnosed with prostate cancer if you have a biopsy. All right? And it's not just one biopsy. It's 16 needles that are stuck in your prostate, which cause you to have erectile dysfunction in about half the people. And uh, six months later, you know, about 15% still have erectile dysfunction. In other words, they are permanently sexually damaged just from the biopsy. Okay. And you would think you'd get something out of that, something positive. Well, here's 15 years of research. And if you read down at the bottom, there's, there, there's no, no reduction in deaths. or it's really it's so small they can hardly even tell. Anyway, that's sad. All right, let's see what we got here. So I wanted to bring you up to date on that research paper. Again, you know you know where to find my original writings on them, which would go back 20, 30 years. It's in the newsletter, uh, Hot Topics. Well, I see this topics. is the same article. You just well, didn't went you... out a little further, right? What is that? This was the same article I was just reading. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. Okay, well, you guys know that we've been through all this discussion in the past about how cancer grows. Yeah. All right, starts as a single cell, say in the prostate, doubles every 100 days. You see it doubling here. Uh, finally, you've had cancer for almost two years. You've got you know fewer than 100 cells in your tumor. And a prostate contains 100 billion cells per prostate. You can't find it at this stage. And you keep doubling. And here you are at two years, about 100 cells. And finally, at six years of growth, You've had cancer six years. You know, if it's gonna spread, it's already spread by then. Six years of growth, it's a millimeter in size, the size of a period on a paper, the size of a lead tip of a pencil. It contains a million cells. You still can't find it. You can't find it by trying to feel it. You can't find it by blood tests. You can't find it by mammograms. You can't find it. And finally, when you get here to a sonometer, a billion cells, the size of an eraser, it's finally detectable. So how, why would you expect a PSA early detection to work? 
Early detection does not save lives. Screening does not, with one exception. And I've talked to you about that. It was in a lecture a couple of weeks ago. And that is with a sigmoid exam to take out precancerous polyps. Otherwise, colonoscopy doesn't save lives. Mammography doesn't save lives. Breast self-examination doesn't save lives, et cetera. The only exception that I can go to the mat with you on is that um, a sigmoid exam to take out precancerous polyps saves lives. But you can't find them. Yeah, or you can on a sigmoid. Here you go. You can now. I thought you said there, but people complain because they're really hard to find a, the doctor that will, will do a sigmoid. Exam. Oh, you can't. That's a, that, you can find the polyps. Oh yeah. You can't well, find the doctor. Can't find the doctor. You know, you go in and you go in even with the data. Oh, they're going to change. You know, when the consumer demands it, they're going to change. Yeah. All right. Okay. Here's a question that came up, Heather, uh, a couple couple of weeks ago. Somebody was asking about uh, how do you treat eosinophilic gastro gastrointestinal disease. There's a kind of white blood cell that's red under the microscope, under the staining. It's called an eosinophil. And this is a kind of cell related to allergies. And they're pretty severe allergies. And you get uh, nausea and diarrhea and stomach pains and you know weight loss and all kinds of things when you have your intestinal tract inflamed. Uh, and it gets inflamed all through the whole intestinal tract, the esophagus, stomach. Etc. And you find these these reddish colored cells, and that's why we call them eosinophils. All right. Well, what, what it says in this article is published March twenty fifth, twenty twenty four, in the new. And I've, I've talked about this in the past. You know that I'm never bringing that to your attention. Is that is that th these uh, these can be due to the foods you eat? Yeah, can be due to the foods you eat, and uh, they list some of the things that we avoid with strictness, like dairy and eggs and sometimes wheat. But here's an article right here. I just eliminated the milk in your diet. You'll have to look it up. And uh, <laughs> they call it a novel approach. <laughs> uh, all right, well, now get on to the topic of tonight. And that is hearing loss. Uh, published head and neck surgery, 2024. Something I've been talking about again for a long time. Uh, what they published in this article was an association between hearing loss and heart attacks, cardiovascular disease. Well, there's a reason why there's an association. And that is your inner ear, which, which is where you have your hearing and your balance, and you hear ringing in your ears called tinnitus. Your inner ear has a blood supply. You can see the blood supply here. It's called the labyrinth artery, okay? It's one artery that comes off of your... Uh, your cerebral arteries. One artery goes to this this uh, inner ear. You see it right here, okay? And and that artery gets plugged up, and as a consequence, you lose your hearing. You get ringing in your ears. You lose your balance. Uh, it's called vertigo. That's what this article is all about. And and because you're dealing with sixty thousand miles of blood vessels, not only does your inner ear get plugged up, but the arteries in your heart get plugged up. And the arteries in your eye, you get macular degeneration. The arteries to your kidneys, you get kidney failure. You know, it, the arteries to your penis, you become impotent. It's, it's disease that happens over the whole body. Anyway, this goes back a long way. Uh, you go back, it goes back to uh, uh, Dr. Rossum. Okay, he published some interesting work back in the 1970s. He and some of his friends traveled around the world. And one of their most important findings was the Malbane, Malban, Malban tribe in Sudan. Uh, they looked at this population of people who live on a frugal diet, they say. The diet's ground millet, uh, nuts, wild dates, and some fish. They possess a few scrawny cattle, a few pigs, a few goats, but they never eat them. And look at what they, they wrote about this population of people who lived on a starch-based diet, millet. They remain the same at 75 as at 15 years of age, as far as their function in their hearing. Yeah. Coronary artery disease is unknown in this tribe. They have minimal generalized atherosclerosis, uh, no varicose veins or thrombosis, uh, no bronchial asthma, no ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. They were well nourished. A posture, posture was erect at all ages. The bodies were muscular and uh, firm. No obesity. They seem to age more slowly and live longer. They remain agile in their 70s and 80s. Now, you remember I've talked to you about Dr. Burkett's work. 
If you haven't heard about Dr. Burke, you want to learn a little bit more about him. Uh, just look up my January 2013 newsletter. January 2013. You'll have a whole discussion about Dr. Burke, who went to Africa, to Uganda, and observed the same things on people on starch-based diets. Anyway, you see their hearing charts on the right. You see the, the, the male bands, they basically don't lose hearing. Whereas here's comparison uh, on the chart on the right of uh, people who live in, in the United States or Western Europe or Australia. You see the different age groups, wow. the difference in hearing. Yeah, it was, it's huge. Anyway. So, uh, you know, we're pretty clear, but I think the important stuff comes out of uh, Dr. Spencer's work. Uh, Dr. Spencer, he published it in 1975. He published on 414 of his patients. You see, Dr. Spencer, he got sick himself. He, he got sick with terrible vertigo. Talks about it in his papers when you read his papers. And he was his first patient. And then what he did is he went with some friends to around Europe and Asia and so on. And they, they looked at uh, the correlation between heart disease and hearing problems. And he came home from his trip got sick with inner ear disease, went on the, a program of uh, a low cholesterol diet and used a little a little niacin and a little bit of uh, other medications we had at that time, very simple stuff. And, and look what he reports. Three years of this regime resulted in 80% of the 83 patients with vertigo, in other words, dizziness, and 90% of those with hearing loss, they got better. They got, they got better. You know, it might not have happened right away. Well, it I takes, think it's well, look, it said it's three a, over three years' time. So well, sometimes what I mean is, you know, people shouldn't start this and expect to be able to hear perfectly tomorrow. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Okay. Uh, and, and and it has to this this return of hearing has to do with two things going on. One, if you start with the the, the frame on your left, you see it's progression of atherosclerosis which plugs up these arteries that go to your heart and your ear, which we talked about in the beginning of this discussion. Remember, I told you, just published. Articles showed up, people who have heart disease have hearing loss. Anyway, you get progressive closure of the arteries of the ears. Plus another thing happens in that when you eat a high fat diet, you, you uh, disturb the circulation. Fat coats the blood cells and they stick together in clumps, and you get a change in your circulation like you see on the left. That, that's before any high-fat meal. And you see the next one, the third the third frame there on your, uh, on your right. That's after a meal that contains 67% of the fat, calories is fat. Two eggs, four strips of bacon, milk, cream, bread, two pats of butter. And you get this tremendous reduction in circulation that you see right before your eyes. And, and the important thing is in the year 2007, they published the same thing, significant improvement in tinnitus and high frequency hearing loss by putting people on a, on a low cholesterol diet, a diet like ours. And they use the same explanation, hyperlipidemia, which is fat, lipids, fat. Uh, if you read right, right below the three frames there, Hyperlipidemia compromises the ox oxygen transport capability of the blood to the cochlea, which is this organ here. And chronic hypoxia is likely to occur by the reduction in oxygen supplied by the inner ear. There, there's, there's a, in these frames that you see up here, there's a five to 20% reduction in oxygen that occurs after this single meal. Now, I think what you have to tell them is that's the exact same picture. Yeah, it's the same, same area of the eye. And the only reason they can't see the heavy veins is because they become opaque, right? You right. can't see the, the Well, the, the little venials, are, they, they, they're transparent. The only reason you can see the tiny little venials in there is because they have red blood cells, which are opaque, flowing through them. So when the red blood cells stop flowing through them, the vessels disappear. That's what you're seeing. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, as far as our work goes, I have to, you know, tell you that this is what we do. You know, this is what we how we help people, either by going to the website and learning the twelve day program for free, or spending uh, twelve days with us with medical care on our telemedicine program. Look at the results we get. Seven days we drop cholesterol, twenty two points over a period of a year. People maintain a drop of about twenty milligrams per deciliter 
in cholesterol, the reduction is made permanent. But we have this is uncontestable data on our program, the McDougal diet. Anyway, all right. Just to bring you back to current discussions, because I know you you need you were you you. you oh, I saw this. this today. Did you see that? Yes. yes. It's it's the diet of people in Gaza, and because they're starving, and you know I I know this is a difficult thing to talk about, but there's some lessons to be learned here. They eat a dish. Can you pronounce that, Mary? Do you think it's kobiza? Yeah, I think so. Or no biza? No. Kobiza. Well, no, no. Uh, an Arabic word for leafy green vegetables. And this is what people are eating there. Is they're eating this kosbiza, which is a, it's it's kind of a, uh, a grass it, or a leaf. It's like spinach. And, and they say they're surviving on that. Well, they're not. I, I assure you they're not. And I'll tell you why. If you look at a serving size, it only contains 23 calories. You know, a, a man has to get 2,000 calories. You don't, you don't have enough time in the day to eat this particular leafy vegetable and get enough calories. So what they're talking about is not just living on this weed, you know, that they're picking out of the fields to stay alive, because they can't. Not enough calories. Is they're consuming it with wheat, with either wraps or breads, and as a result, you can see the calorie come content comes down to something survivable. And the wheat wrap is well, like you see the pictures of the of the kids and with those big uh, rats that they're eating just plain, just a piece of dough. Yeah, that's where Plenty they're getting their, that's where they're getting their calories from. And this brings us back to a discussion of nutritarians, which I know some of you have followed in the past. People will tell you starches are bad. I, I could name the names of some of my colleagues who have gone down that that road of nutritarianism. It, it doesn't work out, folks. Uh, you, you, you don't get enough calories and you can't survive on kale and broccoli and cauliflower and asparagus. But you try and do it and you wonder, I can never be a vegetarian. I couldn't be a vegan. I can't, I can't survive. I suffer too much. Yes, that's true. And that's why we teach a starch-based meal plan. Until you learn the importance of starch, you're not going to be comfortable or in control. So let this be a lesson to us and hope everything works out in that part of the world. Really? Today's comics. No, no. You knew I was going to throw that in one way or another. I always have to put a little, <laughs> little, little, little side note in here for you. Because not only do I, I, I want to save you, I'd like to make my contribution to the planet. And you well know that a major contribution to global warming is the food. And, you know, we're food experts and we're trying to to help people understand that they need to change their diet to mitigate the, the global warming. In fact, we have a website that Heather and Mary and I developed. It's called mcdougalfoundation.org. And I encourage you to go there, mcdougalfoundation.org. Look at what they're saying in the cartoon. We're going to put an umbrella. We're going to dig ourselves underground. We're going <laughs> to, you know, all kinds of silly stuff. Carbon capture. This is the, the biggest joke on the public that there is. Can you imagine having machines to do the work of trillions of trees <laughs> and and millions of years of dinosaurs being stuck in the ground? It ain't going to happen. We have so, we have so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that in efforts to make that our primary focus of so saving ourselves. Plain and simple is not going to work. So we need another way to do it. And they're getting around to it. They're talking about global uh, uh, geoengineering here. That's what this cartoon is about. It's about cooling the planet and ignoring the CO2, pretty much. And there's a way to do that. And I want you to pay attention to this because you've got some time on your hands. And it's got to start someplace. People have to find out about a an effort that I think, I certainly hope, will make a difference. It's not getting the CO2 out of the atmosphere. Again, we're too far for that. It's cooling the planet as they're trying to do with brightening up the clouds, putting umbrellas up, throwing all kinds of particles in the atmosphere. Very dangerous things to do, by the way. There is an approach that does make sense that we can afford to do and we could accomplish if we all got together. And it's got to start someplace. Why not start with us or at least to have, have a contribution? Pretty soon, somebody who really counts it really can make a difference. We'll hear about Mir. Mir, I talked to you about this, and I'm going to talk to you about it on a lot of these presentations. 
because it's important you know about it. It's a volunteer organization. And they have shown by using mirrors that are made out of plastic bottles and aluminum tin cans, aluminum cans. You make mirrors, they cost 10 bucks a piece. You can use solar energy to make them. Right now they're made with fossil fuel, but you can make so use solar energy. And they have shown in Freetown, Africa, that you can cool a community. With, that's what these pictures are in the right-hand corner. Is they've already done demonst demonstration projects that show you can significantly cool a local area, and you can do it with a planet if you get enough mirrors up. Anyway, meer.org, meer.org. It's all yours, Heather. <laughs> all right, great, thank you. Lots of wonderful well, thank information. You, thank, you, thank you, thank you for telling me about not getting the sharing screen up. There. <laughs> Sorry, I let uh, you go on for so long. I just wasn't sure if you were going to get started, but we got no, it. Oh, no, I, I keep, I, I just forget. I get so excited about talking to people <laughs> and the opportunity to answer their questions and everything. And plus, I put a little work on this, these presentations I give you at the beginning. You know, they're all pretty much new, folks. They are. But the truth don't change. That's we why appreciate your time. <laughs> okay, are you ready for some questions? Lots of them coming in while you were talking. Okay. Uh, first, I would like to get to an email that someone sent me. This is from Marilyn. She actually went through the 10-day live-in program about 10 years ago. Uh -huh. um, she's lost all her weight. Her concern is that a couple of her vegan friends are telling her that they have low blood protein and have now started eating animal products because of that. And she's worried and wonders what your thoughts are about that. Well, there may, be, there may be some truth to that, Heather, because there are two kinds of proteins that are in the blood. They're called albumin, which is made by the liver, liver, which gives some viscosity to the blood and some osmotic pressures to the blood. Albumin is really important. And then there's another kind of protein called globulins. Globulins are produced by the immune system in response to inflammation. And when you eat the Western diet, you're inflamed. And so you're making lots of globulins. And if you look at your lab test, they'll separate albumin and globulin. And you'll see that the globulins have gone down. Why? Because you're not inflamed anymore. So yeah, those proteins in the blood go down. But the protein in your blood has nothing to do with the protein you eat. You cannot force more protein out of the diet into the bloodstream, no matter how, how much you eat. It won't happen. It just sounds reasonable. It's the same question we get about sodium on lab tests. Does that tell no, it doesn't matter how salt I have my body. <laughs> but but I've deal, been dealing with this question since I was in general practice. And I, and I would look at everybody's lab tests. And, you know, we're talking about the early 1980s. I would look at their lab tests and they would say the same thing to me. They'd say, Doc, my protein, total protein went down, Doc. And I'd point out and say, look, the albumin, which is made by the liver and excreted by the kidneys, <laughs> which is important for your whole system, that's the same. What's gone down is the globulin from the immune, or the immune system, which is in response to inflammation and you're inflamed because you're eating the Western diet. And when you stop doing that, the globulins go down. But it's just silly talk. And I understand. And you're right, Mary. It's, it just seems so logical that people get confused. Yeah. Thank you. I'll be sure to share that with her. Okay, <laughs> next question. Uh... This is from Crazy Farm Girl. Is there any recommendations to heal or treat interstitial cystitis or ease a flare-up? Well, there's some work on interstitial cystitis. This is the inflammation of the bladder is what we're talking about. Irritating, painful, uh, frequent urinations. I mean, it's just it's really, really active and irritated. So it's from inflammation. And there's some work that says that dairy products can be the culprit, all right? And uh, this goes along with bedwetting problems too. Uh, you develop kind of an interstitial cystitis when children have bedwetting problems. And if you look it up, enuresis or bedwetting, you'll see a, many studies that talk about it being related to milk intake. Well, this would be a similar situation in adults. They have um, an inflamed bladder like you do with bedwetting. With bedwetting, what happens is the kids wet their sheets and their clothes because a swollen bladder sometimes acts like a hive and, and they can't feel the urine buildup. 
So they, the first thing they notice they have to go to the bathroom is they have wet bed, bed sheets. When you take them off the dairy, and you know I've done this in my practice, there's research written on it, is the, the inflammation of the bladder goes away. So I would look at the interstitial cystitis as an adult form that you see in children with enuresis or bedwetting. So I would do that. And the way I would approach it is if all you're willing to give up is the dairy, give it up because that's most likely the cause. <laughs> like with autoimmune diseases, like all autoimmune diseases, arthritis, you know, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's. I mean, you start with dairy if you're not going to give up anything else. And uh, then you go on the basic McDougall diet, no dairy, no, no animal foods at all. And then what you do, and you do this initially, not, 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 you don't do it as a second step. You do it in combination with the first, is you go on a gluten-free diet. You act like you have a leaky gut due to celiac disease. Because, you know, there's various, there's a spectrum of leaky gut. There's a horrible leaky gut, which we call celiac disease. And then there's something in between, which, of course, a lot of people have, which is a, a little touch of, of, uh, of damage to the intestinal tract due to wheat, barley, and rye. So anyway. Uh, and we've seen people like that yeah. that have just a, a slight, they can't eat wheat, but yeah. they're not a true celiac. Does but, it does that sell with them? Well, yeah. them? But they're, but they're not losing the weight. They're not having the diarrhea or, you know, the, the intestinal biopsies that are so obvious where it, you do a biopsy in people who you suspect have celiac disease and you find out that their villi are all flattened and their absorptive surface is destroyed. And so things pass through the intestinal tract undigested, lose weight, have diarrhea, voluminous stools, et cetera. Anyway, um, so I, I would do, you know, do the McDougall diet, of course, dairy's a biggie. And then you uh, go on uh, a diet without wheat, barley, or rye, you do that at the same time. Then you go on to something that we call the elimination diet, which is described in my May, 2014 newsletter. And, you know, I think you have a really good chance. Bes besides that, what do you got to lose? I mean, what, why don't you try this? It costs nothing. No side effects. What do you got to lose? And if it works, you've solved your problem. And what do you have to gain by waiting? There, there's no treatment out there that I know of for uh, interstitial cystitis. No successful treatment that any doctors prescribe. So it's not like, you know, not like you've got some miracle cure from the medical business sitting out there waiting for you. You don't have to change your diet. Anyway, you you won't be disappointed. So this is different from a, um, like a bladder infection. Or something. Yeah, yeah, it's inflammation. Okay. And what happens is the you eat the dairy. Uh, it goes into the intestinal tract, goes into the bloodstream, and some of the dairy proteins excreted in the bladder. Yeah. And the bladder reacts, uh, and it becomes swollen like a hive. Right, so that's diff that completely different from a um, urinary tract. Oh, yeah, well, urinary tract would usually be to a bacteria. Yeah, yeah. So, but it feels the same. I'm sure. <laughs> or it can, if not, maybe maybe not as bad as a urinary tract infection, but maybe. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Hanging Out with Kim. She's whole food, plant based, but her cholesterol is still two forty. What would you recommend? Or what would you say? Well, whether or not you have a positive future outcome depends upon your compliance with the program, not dependent upon what your cholesterol happens to, to result in after you change your diet. But, and I know that not only from our work, but also Dean Ornish's work. When he saw reversal of atherosclerosis, it was, was correlated with the compliance with the program not with the blood cholesterol drops. All right, so cholesterol is just a marker. Nobody dies of high cholesterol. I've never seen it. It doesn't occur. If this is a risk factor. It's just a sign that tells you you've been eating too many animal foods, that's all, because animal foods contain cholesterol, plant foods don't. So you eat a whole bunch of cholesterol, what happens? What do you think happens? Blood cholesterol goes up. All body tissues go up in cholesterol. But the common denominator is the animal food. So now that you understand that, you have to realize uh, that there are people out there, particularly women, who run stubborn cholesterols and sometimes quite high. This one was 250. I've had women that have cholesterols as high as 350 who can't take statins, 
who we've done uh, 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 heart scans on to check to see if they have any artery disease. You know, it's a short of doing an opto autopsy or, or an angiogram. This is what you do. You do an x-ray. And we find their arteries are baby clean. So don't let it spoil a, a single day. Now, if it's going to spoil your day and you decide that you want to lower your cholesterol, you need to realize that the all the studies on cholesterol-lowering drugs are disappointing. Statins barely, barely reduce your risk of dying. And essentially only in people who have already had heart attacks, strokes, heart surgery. The general population, there's, there's the change is so minimal, they can't even see it. That's statins. The uh, KSCP9, whatever they're called, uh, uh, antibody approaches, they're monoclonal antibody approaches, oh. that cost $10,000 a year for two shots, have not been shown to reduce your risk of dying, period. You know, and, and so it is with all the drugs. They lower cholesterol. But cholesterol is not the problem. The food's the problem. This is what you do if you're worried about the number. I've tried to convince you not to, but sometimes that doesn't work out. You've got to see that number low. There's an herb called berberine, which is as, as effective as the other medical doctor prescribed cholesterol-lowering medications. It'll lower your cholesterol. It's an herb, inexpensive, without prescription. You want to see your numbers go down. You've already tried the diet. <laughs> Take berberine. Well, won't do you any harm as far as I know. Great, thank you. Okay, next question. I hear this a lot. Can you tell us why, well, lots of us think that fish is a health food and it doesn't have nearly as much fat and cholesterol as other meat products. Can you talk about that a bit? That's just like I showed you them, Mabans, Mabanians, the people from Sudan. We started this discussion. They had a, a, a fish in their diet, but it was a very little amount of fish. Um, How to get started though? It was, it was, oh, switching from red meat to white meat. So it started. So it was chicken and fish because they were white and yeah, couldn't eat red. Yeah, but but as it turns and out, then it turns out that the fish has just as much cholesterol or more than the actually red has meat more. Does. Yeah. Okay, actually has more. Uh, gram for gram, pound for pound. Fish and chicken have more cholesterol than beef and pork. But that's a whole other discussion we need to get into. Uh, why fish? Why did fish get picked on? Well, I think it had to do with the fats, Mary. Oh, Ansel, fat. Ansel, Ansel, fat. Keys, okay. Ansel Keys have, has the formula that predicts uh, whether the, what the blood cholesterol will turn out to be based upon how much fat and how much cholesterol you need. It's the Keys formula. Every medical student is taught the Ansel Keys formula. <laughs> So what Ansel Keys did is he had a ratio where saturated fat raised the cholesterol and polyunsaturate, fish fat is polyunsaturate, lowers cholesterol. And then you multiply that by the amount of cholesterol in the food. And, and when you have uh, polyunsaturated fats, you end up with a lower cholesterol. And it, all experiments done, like the Finnish hospital study, the veteran study where they house people and they changed their diet over years and they put them on corn oil or other vegetable oils. You know, they all show that these vegetable oils lower cholesterol, but but they increase your risk of dying of heart disease. Not, not fish oil. Fish oil lowers your risk of dying of heart disease, probably. But omega-6 fats, corn oil, raise your risk of dying of heart disease. Okay, the fish thing. Let's get back to that. <laughs> if you decide to go on a high fish diet, uh, fish thins the blood because it has the omega-3 fats. Well, that's desirable because you want the blood to thin so that when a, a pustule pops and it tends to form a clot, and we've been over that before, how these pustules break, you're less likely to have a clot form because you're eating fish oil. Same thing happens with aspirin. It prevents the blood from clotting. So this is a very important step in having a heart attack or a stroke is this blood clot. So that's the advantage, but you have to realize there are disadvantages to thinning your blood. Like if you get in a car accident, you're, you're likely to bleed to death. Well, you told me something else too about something that's in um, some medicine that also is not good for the bones. Besides being bad for your blood, you take this and it, it thins your blood, but it also is bad for your bone or bone growth. I don't know what that is, Mary. Well, yeah. You'll have to think about that one more. 
The uh, non-steroidal. Oh, non-steroidal. Non-steroidal antibodies. Well, oh, these are drugs. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Anti-inflammatory. Well, I think you're but, referring but that's to. That's they take for arthritis. Right. Is your non-steroidals like your? Keep track of the fish thing for a minute, folks. <laughs> the non-steroidals, like Advil and Motrin and so on, they increase your risk of dying of a heart attack. Aspirin, which is also a non-steroidal. Yeah. Reduces yeah. your risk of dying. But also, you said it prevents bone growth or something like non that. Non do. Okay. Yeah, non prevent you from from healing. And I've I've talked to every dentist I come in contact with who talks about poor bone formation. You know, they're trying to do tooth transplants and so on. They put these people on Advil. They get to, they give you a yeah they, they give you a prescription. And I have told so many <laughs> dentists, look, here's the research. You you inhibit bone growth, and what you're trying to do when you do all these. Uh, uh, tooth transplants or whatever you're up to, oral surgery, you're trying to get the bone to grow and you give them a, a drug that's pretty much guaranteed. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. All right, let's get back to fish. All right. All right, so you thin the blood, reduce the risk of a blood clot forming. That's good. You thin the blood, get an accident, that's bad. All right, the other thing to talk about fish oil, like cod liver oil, is it helps with arthritis. It suppresses the immune system. Okay, that. But when you suppress the immune system, you suppress the whole immune system. So you have an increased risk of infections. Even eating fish, when they compare to fish eaters to non-fish eaters, they have an increased risk of getting viral infections. Okay? And also, you need an immune system to slow or stop cancer growth. When you suppress the immune system, you increase the cancer growth. Now, I, I can show you studies in in uh, mice and rats where they feed flaxseed oil, omega-3 fats, fish oils, to these animals where they induce tumors, where the, the tumor ends up to be a thousand times greater in volume when you feed the omega-3 fat than those who are on the low-fat diet. A thousand times. So these, these encourage cancer growth. All right, so there's no fiber, there's no vitamin C, uh, no beta carotene, you know. Well, how, and, how about just the fact that there, there aren't any fish? You know? well, that was gonna, that was, that was gonna mess last. Mary and I are real ocean people. We've owned, owned ocean going sailboats and I've been a windsurfer for most of my life. Done a few other things to the ocean, which I'm not proud of. <laughs> but yeah, when I first started going into the ocean when I was uh, 12 years old, 90% uh, of the fish are gone between the time I was a boy and now. They're gone, 90%. So eat up, folks. Still believe well, in fish, eat up, because there's only a few left. No, now they talk about fish farms, though. But yeah. that's there are other problems associated with well, fish farm you, you don't have, right? You don't, you, don't have the, you don't have the fatty acid spectrum that you have in natural fish, because they don't eat all the algae. They feed them... Uh, Feed them soybeans and yeah, all kinds, all of, kinds of stuff, food, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's that's one problem. The, the other is that they make them pink by giving them dye. Yeah. So they do that. Plus, there's an infection problem. Uh, they put them in these big pens and they get these huge infections, which spread to the wildlife. Mm -hmm. Plus, plus these fish farms eat the fish that the wild fish want to eat, need to eat. So there's no fish left for the the wild salmon to eat. Or, you know, eating fish is a bad thing. Of, of all the animal foods that I would ask you to give up, fish would be first. Just for all these reasons. You know, it's just like I'd ask you to give up dairy before anything else. Yeah. Even there's before so, the fish. There's too many reasons. Golly. Yeah. If you have the whole list of what causes what, it would be dairy and then fish and then probably yeah. eggs and... Chicken, eggs, I don't know. You know, Mary and I, we, we love fish. We used to have, a, I don't even want to tell you what we used to do. <laughs> but anyway, we, we've been a big fan of fish and probably know most of the fish that are in the ocean. You know, we put a lot of time in studying them, snorkeling with them, scuba diving with them. And, oh, we went everywhere. Yeah, you take, you take me to an aquarium, which you're not going to do anymore because these are fish prisons. And I used to enjoy them, but I don't anymore. So, you know, I can grow up too. I can mature also. I'm, I'm not stuck in destructive beliefs. Yeah. Once you become aware, you you know, things can change you if you let them. And it's never too late. Yeah. yeah. And there, there are infections you can get fit fish, like, you know, the round worms. And, oh, yeah. You know, there, there are all kinds of... I think farm-raised fish is worse. 
is, but that's what most people are buying. Yeah, I know. Yeah, you're you're buying because they think it's better for the shrimp environment because it's not you're not taking it out of the well, sea. You're make more money. Yeah, that's why they do. That's right. That's why they do it. They don't do it for any other reason. Yeah, well, it's a it's nice. a it's a bigger business, but it's not for the consumer. It's certainly not for the fish. Thank you. Okay, next question. This is from Bonnie. Her husband's been trying to get his blood sugar down with a diet for the last month. He's about 200 to 300 blood sugar range. He isn't taking any insulin, but she's wondering if they should just give up and take the injections. Maybe. Is he, but you should, okay, let me start in the beginning. There's type one diabetes where you have no insulin. You know, they, they, that's the pancreas is shut down. And then you have type two diabetes where there's loads of insulin. In between you have a, a spectrum that I call one and a half diabetes where there might be some pancreatic insufficiency, insufficient insulin production. And there also might be some resistance, insulin resistance, which is how you get type two diabetes. So in between is this spectrum of these two things working kind of against each other. So if that's the case, if he has one and a half type diabetes, in other words, he falls in that spectrum. He makes enough insulin to stay out of the hospital, but not enough insulin to control a lot of things, like his blood sugar. The insulin will make the blood sugar go down. Or he may be losing too much weight. You stop that by giving a little insulin. Or he may be urinating tremendously, and that means you're very thirsty. So a little this insulin... Is not something he can correct by himself. He has to get a prescription. He has to get a, yeah, has to get a doctor's... Approval and uh, prescription, all that stuff. Now, I don't prescribe any of the diabetic pills. They're very, very dangerous. And there's a whole lecture I give on that it's on YouTube. So don't go that route. I give insulin. I give a long-acting insulin. And most of my people with type 1 and a half diabetes can get by with, say, 5 or 10 units of Lantus. It's the one I use in the evening. One shot. That's it. But that's <laughs> if you're losing too much weight. The question I have for you to ask her is, is your husband still overweight? Because if he's still overweight, he's got some improvement with insulin resistance to accomplish. Insulin resistance is caused by being too fat. Plain and simple. You lose weight by any means and insulin re resistance improves. So does he have more weight to lose? You know, it sounds like he has type one and a half diabetes and he may need some insulin to stop excessive weight loss, excessive urination or excessive worry which is what you're telling me, <laughs> excessive worry about the numbers. I wouldn't worry about the numbers, but I know you do. So, you know, that, 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 that statement will require a lot of explanation as to why I wouldn't worry about the numbers. So don't even get into that yet tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Next question. This is from Christine. She's Wow, she says she's been whole food plant based for ninety years. I don't know if wow. she is ninety wow. years, but long time. Uh, her uh -huh. HDL is forty six, and she's wondering if she should be worried. <laughs> no, <laughs> look, HDL is just a fraction. Remember that word, fraction. What's her total cholesterol? Of total cholesterol. So you got total cholesterol, and one fraction of that is HDL high density lipoprotein and one fraction is low density and then there's a medium density. So, so there, you know, you, you, you fractionate this total cholesterol into different masses and that's and why the high density is supposed to leave faster or something, right? It is. That's, that's the form the body of, of the cholesterol is in before it's removed the high density. Okay. So one of the ways to raise your good cholesterol is to eat more cholesterol. So your doctor, if you want your cholesterol to go up to, you know, 60 or 58 or whatever you wanted at, just eat some more, some more animals. <laughs> It'll go up. So your total cholesterol or, or the other situation is more common in our practice is you eat a healthy diet. You drop your total cholesterol, say a hundred points. Doctor says, well, that's good, but look at your good cholesterol. You drop that in half. Well, what should I do, doc? Well, just eat some meat. It'll go up. <laughs> Don't fall into this total cholesterol. If you'll listen to my lecture on heart disease, you'll realize that all I use in my practice for caring for you, I, out of curiosity, I might get some other things, but I only use total cholesterol. That's it. I don't use fractions. 
I don't use lipoprotein A and B. I don't use particle size. I don't care what you invent in a laboratory. I don't use it. I'm not interested in it. You just confuse me. Keep it simple, right? Yes. <laughs> Truth is simple and easy to understand. Uh, let's see, DAR1213 would like you to talk a bit about histamine intolerance. Uh, it'd be hard for me to do, Heather, because I, I haven't looked at it in a while, but it would be a, a food reaction uh, that really produces, uh, I, I, you can look it up, but I don't know. It, uh, histamines are involved in the allergic reactions. So you get, you know, mucus, stuffy nose, hives, those kinds of things. But I, I don't know if the antihistamine diet oh. is anymore. Yeah, histamines. Histamines are involved in inflammation, headaches, rashes, swelling, itching, things I just mentioned. Yeah, how do you fix it? How do you fix it? <laughs> Other than making changes to your eating pattern, there's not much you can do to fix it. And I'd have to look up what the antihistamine foods are. I don't I don't know that this is even true. You know, there's so many diets out there that are invented that just, you know, uh, very, very isolated oh, research. Yeah, it. it's, a, it's assumed to be due to a deficiency of the gastrointestinal enzyme, yeah. diamine. That breaks down history. DAO, yeah. It's all coming back. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I, I would... Listen, I, I think the approach you should take if you're really serious about dealing with your histamine is you should eat a very, very repetitive, monotonous, simple diet. In other words, what, what I would do is if, if this was troubling enough for me, is I would eat a diet of sweet potatoes and water. See if I got better. Or you could go to True North and you could fast. You could go on the ultimate elimination diet, which is water. They'll, they'll, they'll help you figure it out. Yeah, but I bet you wouldn't react to sweet potatoes and water. I don't think And you would. could eat enough of those that you'd be satisfied all day. You'd be orange, too. It'd be boring. But you'd be you'd orange. Be satisfied. Be orange. orange with all the carotene. Oh, God. But, but orange is good. One of the things I'm talking about this Wednesday, I'm giving a talk on April 10th, oh, yeah. 2024. And um, it's going to be on, on sex uh, and, aware, and uh, attractiveness and how to make yourself more attractive with your diet. And one of the things I'm going to talk about is how carotene, carotene uh, is a color that people associate with good health. And uh, carotene is an, uh, an attractive color of your skin. And it depends upon how much carotenoids that you eat, which comes in carrots and sweet potatoes and so on. But this is one of the attraction colors. The other attraction color you're going to learn about is red. Red, red is, you know, it's a it, lipstick, dresses, etc. So we're going to learn about color, which you can change by eating carotenes, or a whole bunch of other ways I'm going to show you how to change your color to be more reddish and orangish, which is more attractive. By the way, this is a big deal in the fish and, and reptile and fish and bird businesses. The color yellow is, is really important in all these animals. Anyway, uh, we're going to do this lecture on Wednesday. If you want to sign up for it, it's going to be 10 o'clock in the morning. Pacific time and Heather's sending out our notice. So get on one of our mailing lists so we can let you know about it. And you know, Heather, I gave you the option of charging for this. You surprised? Nope, it's free. <laughs> no, no. free well, I, I, no. I spent two years do, developing this lecture. <laughs> now, I've been working on this for two years. I think I got it down. And I you're not, you're not, you're, it's free. Yes. It's free. No gimmicks. It's, 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 it's a way of us. Uh, sharing with you and helping you along and thanking you for being involved in this revolution, this movement. And I want to teach you as much as I can. And this is a lecture that you have never seen before. It's not on YouTube. Uh, I've never given it before. It's brand new. Odor, sight, hearing. You get three ways you communicate. Your eyes, your nose, and your ears. So what I'm going to share with you is three ways of enhancing your communication in these three areas, okay? Uh, sight, uh, odor, and uh, sound. I'm going to teach you how to enhance these three communication uh, opportunities, whatever they are, these three ways of communicating 
so that you can be a more attractive person. That's what I'm going to teach you. And with diet, of course, what would you expect? <laughs> You'll like the lecture. Sign up for it. Wednesday, Good, I look forward April to it. 10th. So no, you actually, you don't have to sign up. It's going to be here live on YouTube. So they'll just show up like they do Sunday nights at 5 p.m. And we'll be here 10 a.m. Pacific cool. Wednesday. Are, are, Wednesday. Is, are you sending out notices out here? We will. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Instagram, YouTube, our mailing list. I'll send yeah. out a reminder, but we'll be here this Wednesday, April 10th at 10 a.m. Pacific. And if they miss it, I'm sure they can get it on YouTube yeah. afterward, right? They'll put up afterwards. Oh, yeah. So the replay, the replay will be on our channel. So if you can't make it, then you can watch it later. Heather has not seen this lecture. Nope. No. I can't wait. Mary has not seen this lecture. I have. I've heard it. In fact, when I put the title Attractiveness and Sex in it, Heather wouldn't even talk to me. <laughs> I'm her well, dad. come you on. Know? I'm your daughter. <laughs> it's like TMI. <laughs> But it's important. Well, I, we, we need to hear about important. it. So I look forward I, to I'm it. Gonna, I'm going to talk to talk to you as if my daughter was not listening. <laughs> Plan on it. It's going to be it's going to be very frank about how to make yourself a better communicator, not just for sexual relations, but at your workplace. You know, you want to be attracted to your fellow employees because an attractive person works more efficiently. It is a, a better employee makes more money for the company. So it's not just sex. It's all it's all it's your whole life you want to be attractive as possible. All right, we'll do that on Wednesday, April 10th, 10 o'clock Pacific time. Join us. <laughs> yes, I look forward to it. Okay, we Wednesday. still have four minutes left. So let's get to a few more questions. We've got a bunch right. that I won't even get to, but here's a new one I haven't heard before. This is from Struss. What do you do if you have Pseudomonas aeruginosa? That's a bacteria. Oh, Pseudomonas is a very that was. <laughs> oh. Heather, you know, I, I spent my years as a training resident in a hospital where I took care of people who had pseudomonas aeruginosus infections all the time. And we'd have to get out the special antibiotics for that because pseudomonas is a tough one to treat, as I remember. It doesn't respond to many antibiotics, and so you got to you got to get a really a specific antibiotic to treat this particular infection. What would you do? Well, it's what you do with all infections is you drain them. In other words, if they're an abscess, you lance it, uh, and you take antibiotics and you you know improve well, your for, for just said for an infection like that. You would guess you'd have you maybe have to have a um a test get the proper antibiotic. Well, that would they, they would, sure. Yeah, we would take a sample of your blood yeah. of your urine, and we'd do a culture and sensitivity, and we'd identify the kind of bacteria. So you see, uh, they do that in labs, uh, all over hospitals, independent labs, is they take an auger, which is a sugar that bacteria could grow on, and it's a little petri dish, and you take some urine and you throw it on there. And it grows all different kinds of bacteria, and they can identify the bacteria based on how the colonies look. And we have you know, testing; we can tell what bacteria are there. But that's the way we turn determine it. So you test it, you pick the most uh, uh, efficient antibiotic, and you drain. You got to make sure you drain the area so that uh, it heals. Great, learn something new. <laughs> I love it. Okay, next. Well, let's see, we've got two minutes. We can probably get uh, another uh, one in wow. here. Um, okay, how, this is from Mr. Backyard Engineer. How can we mim minimize the negative effects of PPIs if we have taken them long term? Oh, proton pump inhibitors like uh, no. Prilosec, Naproxen. No, 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 no. no. no oh, that's uh, allergies. No, Naproxen is a non steroidal anti inflammatory. Uh, anyway, you got it. You know it all. Prilosec. Prilosec and Nexium. Nexium is what I was thinking of. Oh, but there's about, a, little, a little side note to this question. This is for someone that has alkalization, who's got, undergone a Heller myotomy. Oh, my goodness. Without fundoplication. Uh, I, don't really, <laughs> I don't remember those terms. <laughs> or you just get off the PPIs. PPIs block the movement of hydrogen acid from your body and blood into your gastrointestinal tract where it's eliminated from the body. 
they block the elimination of acid. So you accumulate acid all over your body, which increases your risk of fractures, osteoporosis, and kidney stones. You just stop the drug and you do what you'll do for any thin bone problem, osteoporosis problem, bone mineral density problem, et cetera, is you walk around, in other words, careful exercise, sunshine, and a starch-based diet that is somewhat low in protein. In other words, I wouldn't hit beans, peas, and lentils heavy. I, I would make them a minimal part of the diet. Great, thank you. Perfect timing, six o'clock. All right. Okay. You, you, I, want, I want to know about your next class. When are you going to hold another class? We really love going to those classes, Heather. <laughs> I mean, we would love being part of them. That's one of our, our most important times every every few months. Not for, not until May. Not until May, okay. May 10th. You are both a very important part of the program. You wake up with us every morning, 9 a.m., and and meet with the whole group, but one-on-one, -on -one, you know, like this for 45 minutes every morning. So we appreciate you, but not until May 10th. All okay. right. Good. Uh, you, you, I, I assure you, you'll say to yourself after you take the 12 days with us, you'll say, why didn't I do that a long time ago? This has been such a, a, an important change in my life. We'll work you over for 12 days. <laughs> We're good. Change your life. <laughs> well, and um, let's see, until then, let's see, we've got this Wednesday, 10 a.m. Don't forget, right. Sex, Food, okay. and Attractiveness here live on YouTube. And then we'll see you also next Sunday at 5 p.m. Pacific. All right. All right. See you. Thank you, Heather. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mom and Dad.